Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Retro Gaming Today Com video, we're going to be discussing Ryzen 7 and the 1700X because a bunch of benchmarks have appeared on the internet as well as official slides from AMD which show off the CPU's architecture as well as some of its own official internal benchmarks. The benefit of these benchmarks is it's not just CPU Z or I don't know. Um, a Cinebench run or something like that. It's actually games and a lot of other stuff. Now we will be getting a 1700X of our own, a motherboard and other bits and bobs. We're waiting for those to be sent to us. In fact, they should be arriving tomorrow. We have already a decent case from Betfenix, which has already arrived. We have a CPU cooler um, from Corsair. We have a load of other stuff that's already here, so essentially we're just waiting for the motherboard and the processor, which one could argue is probably the most important part. In fact, the argument would be very hard to beat, but still, um, there you have it. So we will be tackling that tomorrow. But I did want to focus on this, simply because, quite frankly, if you're still on the fence on Ryzen, and you're like, should I order it, should I run into town tomorrow, this might give you some incentive. So first of all, we're going to go through some of the technology slides. I won't go over these super in depth because quite frankly, we've already been over Ryzen's architecture a few other times by now. And quite frankly, it mostly tra uh, goes over old ground. Uh, these slides are from videocards.com to give them credit. Now, what's really nice about SMT is it's telling us that, that there's an additional 41% of performance with Cinebench R15 with SMT enabled. That's actually quite nice scaling. And it basically indicates that, at least in theory, I will have to see how this um, will kind of play out if we start running into the system BIOS and changing SMT enabled, disabled across a variety of different applications. But it seems like you're not going to get that much contention, thread contention for resources. So, in short, the uh, various caches and all the other bits and pieces in the CPU are not going to basically stall one thread while one's executing, so that's quite nice. Um, we already know about things such as the two threads per core, wider micro-op dispatch, larger retire queues, 128 quad issue FPU, um, larger queues, um, and better caching system. Basically speaking, the CPU can handle uh, more data at a time, it's better at retiring the data, it's better at actually predicting when that data is going to be required, what branch a specific path uh, data is going to follow, and basically better at actually fetching instructions ahead of time. That's essentially the too long didn't read version. Uh, so basically aggressive clock gating basically means that if a particular section of a CPU is not going to be utilized, it will shut off for, you know, and this is obviously with microseconds. This isn't like two or three seconds. It shuts it down and then comes back. These are all microse um, microseconds. Core functional unit, nothing too new here. We do get a nice dice shot, including the 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache, the instruction cache, the load store, the data cache, the FPU, which is quite meaty to say the least, as well as the ALU, the scheduler, the decoder, and finally the neural net prediction, which actually takes up quite a lot of die space. We also have a bit more information on level 2 cache, but quite frankly, we kind of know most of this stuff anyway. And also the fact that um, the level 3 cache is mostly exclusive of level 2. That basically means, for those who don't know, the CPU will do its utmost to make sure there's no mirroring of data. So in short, let's say it has an instruction, I, I'm just obviously using this as an example, go to the shop. Go to the shop won't be in both level 2 and level 3 cache, so that's quite nice. Um, and that's pretty much it, apart from the Zen Core, which also we kind of knew anyway. It's basically just ever so slightly improving the knowledge we had. And uh, Neural Net Prediction, Decoupled Branch Predictor, Free Level TLB for BP Pipe for Accelerated Instruction Prefetch, Two Branches per BTB Entry, Neural Net Enabling Prediction of Two Branches per Cycle, which obviously is going to be really important for multi-threading. Uh, 32 entry return stack and 512 entry indirect target array. Essentially, neural net prediction predicts and learns how code works on a specific application. Now, we did learn from Robert Halleck from AMD that 
obviously that it's not like it's got two gigabytes of storage for this so eventually code is going to kind of become old and obsolete and be removed so it's not like it can uh, remember this for like 20 applications at once but it will remember it for titles that are uh, sorry applications which are running right now cpu complex information so a ccx is four cores connected uh, to one uh, free uh, level free cache um, sorry one set of eight megabytes of level free cache it's made up of uh, four slices and every core can access every cache with the same average latency so in short core one can access the cache which is associated to core two and so on and so on now the really nice thing about this is you can then stack these ccx's basically this is the lego approach that amd have been taking for some time now with its new components especially its gpus so it's kind of nice um I could certainly keep going into this, but as I said, a lot of the stuff we've covered previously, so I don't necessarily want to drag too much of the video down with an analysis. If you want me to, by all means, you could ask, and I'll possibly try and throw it into the full Ryzen review. But anyway, um, let's focus on gaming performance. Now, these are slides which have appeared on the internet. Now, there are a couple of things that immediately spring to mind. First of all, these are at 1440p. And they are testing the 1700 versus the 7700K. The first thing you're going to notice is that if you are running um, Ryzen 7, it seems to work really nicely across DirectX 12. However, DX11 titles, not so well. So in short, if you are running, let's say, Doom on Vulkan, then the scaling is really nice and Ryzen certainly wins. GTA 5, GTA 5, despite the fact that it does scale across multiple cores, typically it works really well with a couple of cores being really fast. And you can start testing your, yourself by, if you own GTA 5 and, you know, you, you've got a spare few minutes to, you know, kill, you can go into BIOS and start disabling or enabling the CPU cores and uh, SMT if you happen to have have it on your processor and you can see that typically GTA 5 does like higher uh, number of uh, threads yes but typically more important to GTA 5 quite frankly is raw clock speed however um, these benchmarks continue and it does seem that yes gaming performance of the uh, Ryzen is very impressive overall but isn't quite up to snuff with the 7700k in DirectX 11 titles with that all said an unofficial review has popped up um, and this website I'm probably going to butcher the name of I'm terribly sorry um, but it is Shah Rakh Hassar probably butchered the uh, name of that and essentially they've got an, what we believe to be an engineering sample Ryzen CPU um, it is running with the B350 the motherboard is an MSI B350 Tomahawk and the CPU-Z is detecting the RAM running at 2133 MHz. So it's not particularly amazing or anything like that. And they're running a GTX 980. So once again, it's not an amazing GPU. You could certainly go higher than that. I won't go through all of the tests that they've got because that would be unfair and uncool for me to do that. I'll simply link their review in the video description. But they have both synthetic benchmarks and also gaming benchmarks. So what do we learn about this? Well, if you're looking at like ADA64 extreme CPU hash, then obviously it absolutely decimates the 7700K. For example, Sysoft Sandra 2016, well, yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. 3D Mark 2011, it doesn't quite pip the 7700K, but it's within throwing distance. Firestrike, it does beat out the 7700K and the 5960X, but loses to the 6950X. PC mark. Well, this one's a bit closer. However, the 6700K does slightly win out. You can start seeing a pattern here. Applications which primarily require high clock speed but don't necessarily scale across multiple threads particularly well definitely do favor Intel CPUs. Um, for example, Cinebench R15 CPU benchmark single thread is getting 148 which is not bad, but it doesn't quite win out to 196 of the 7700K or the 179 of the 6700K, and it's actually slightly slower than the 4770K. Multi-thread, however, is 15 
107, which is considerably higher than even the 5960X. Let's be honest, if you're running Sydney Bench, you're not exactly going to be like, oh, okay, gee, I'm just going to run it on this one CPU. And the same thing for 7-Zip and also Dolphin. Dolphin, it's, well, the slowest. There are some things, however, we need to take into account with this. One, this is only one configuration with only one set of RAM. I would like to see what happens when we start, well, seeing it across multiple review samples. Uh, Batman Arkham Origins, well, it's not bad. It's basically, essentially competitive. Um, if you look at the most extreme example, which is... Uh, 1366 by 768 which basically means absolutely no uh, GPU limitation at all it's really down just to CPU then there's not that much separating the two and if you take it to the extreme which is 1080p with four times MSAA then it's 91 frames a second versus essentially not 89 frames a second GTA 5 we have another image uh, which is quite nice to see as a point of comparison and in this one it's ever so slightly slower than um, the 7700K. What does all of this mean? Well, unfortunately, there's just not that much information at the moment to really give us an indication of how the CPU is going to perform because, quite frankly, we don't have a large enough sample size. And this is even more in important when we start figuring out that we don't know how Ryzen is going to scale across different memory clocks. We don't know what how board performance works, if there's going to be any bugs in the BIOS which are affecting performance. And naturally, the other thing is RAM timings, you know, what version of the processor are they using? Uh, with overclocking, they managed to get to 3991 megahertz, which did naturally improve performance quite considerably. For example, in the case of Bioshock Infinite, it took the performance up from, uh, and I'm going to be using 768, it took it from 173 all the way up to 180, which isn't massive, but it is enough to be, you know, quite noticeable in games. Cinebench had also really beefed up the performance. Now, I know this video might sound a bit confusing to many of you because it's like, okay, well, do I still buy Ryzen? My advice to you is the following, and I'm not, you know, advocating one thing or the other, but this is what I would do. If you are looking for a processor specifically only, only for gaming, I would wait for a little bit. I'm not saying wait, you know, a month. I'm saying wait a couple of days. Wait for more reviews, wait for folks to actually get hold of it and figure out if, if if this is the processor for you. Also, if you're buying for games which are DirectX 12 or Vulcan or what have you, and you're like, okay, I don't mind being a few frames slower, that's fine. Then by all means, buy a 1700X or what have you. If you are doing a lot of encoding, if you're doing a lot of virtual machines, running a lot of virtual machines, that type of thing, Ryzen, from the looks of these early preliminary graphs, looks like it's for you. On the other hand, if you are gaming only, and I stress only, a 7700K might be the better option, or stick with your 6700K or whatever. Obviously, we're just going to have to wait and see, um, and that's kind of the reason I'm bringing this to your attention, because we will be doing our own benchmarks, but even then, there's only like one point of comparison. We do have a 4770K we can pair it with. We've got a, um, we have a couple of Skylake CPUs we've got it, we can compare it with. We've got even a 2500K we can compare it with. And obviously we can start overclocking those different systems and all that jazz. And we've got multiple GPUs we can test it with. But essentially there are only a certain amount of things we can do. So I think it's good we work as a community, but I did want to bring this to your attention just so that you can be better informed. But with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Uh, remember, like, share, subscribe. That would be greatly appreciated. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves and do join me for the uh, Ryzen coverage over the next couple of days. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.